a grim spectacle. In the serene morning, Ethan slumbered peacefully, embraced by tranquility. However, as if stirred by sudden force, the village bell, gracefully stationed atop the worn-out tower, rang out with a vibrant resonance. Dong. The sound pierced through the stillness, its echoes reverberating across every nook and cranny of the village. The villagers halted their daily routines, captivated by the melodic chime. Dong. The resounding tone, now intertwined with the echoes of its previous toll, beckoned the young and old to assemble. Dong. The sound intensified, layering its lingering echoes upon one another. Conversation ceased, and laughter gave way to hushed whispers. The bell's vibrations enveloped Ethan's heart, rousing him from his slumber with a startled surprise. What's happening? he wondered aloud. Just then, his parents burst into his room, their faces filled with urgency. Ethan! Wake up! The villagers have been summoned to the main plaza. I never wanted you to witness this, but sometimes things are inevitable, his father explained, his voice laced with concern. Confused, Ethan queried, What do you mean, father? Without uttering a word in response, Ethan's father tightly grasped his hand and pulled him out of bed with a forceful urgency. His mother trailed closely behind, wearing a perturbed expression on her face. The three of them hurriedly exited the inn and embarked on a swift journey towards the bustling Central Market Plaza. Sensing his parents' reticence and unease, Ethan refrained from further questioning. He understood that the answers he sought would soon be revealed, unveiling the cause behind their solemn expressions and the air of silence that enveloped them. As they made their way through the village, Ethan noticed a steady stream of other villagers converging toward the same destination. People of all ages, including children, adults, and the elderly, were compelled to answer the summon without exception. The atmosphere buzzed with a mix of curiosity and apprehension, evident in the hushed conversations that drifted around him. How long has it been since we had a public execution, whispered one villager to another. I can't recall, but it must be something serious for it to happen in public, responded the second villager, his voice tinged with curiosity. As Ethan caught snippets of the nearby conversations, he couldn't help but be surprised by the words he overheard. The mention of a public execution served as a chilling reminder that he resided in a world where lawlessness and barbarity still prevailed. In moments like these, it was easy to forget the darker aspects of the society in which he resided. The execution ground was a grim and eerie sight, bathed in an atmosphere heavy with solemnity. The scene evoked a sense of grandeur mixed with an unsettling sense of unease. The onlookers had gathered, their expressions ranging from morbid curiosity to quiet despair. The crowd stretched as far as the eye could see, a mass of faces that reflected a mixture of emotions. At the forefront of the execution ground stood a raised platform, a stage upon which the condemned would face their fate. Thick, iron chains dangled ominously, binding those unfortunate souls about to face their final moments. Surrounding the platform were guards, their expression stern, a clear reminder of the seriousness of the situation. As the executioner stood poised with his massive weapon, the crowd's murmurs subsided into an eerie silence. The anticipation grew palpable as the final moments leading up to the execution hung heavy in the air. It was a scene of somber spectacle. Ethan's gaze fell upon the group of individuals who were forcefully brought into the execution platform. There were five of them, three men who looked like they had seen their fair share of life, probably in their mid-thirties. There was also a young woman, maybe in her mid-twenties, her eyes filled with a mix of fear and resignation. And then there was this young boy who barely seemed like he had even become an adult yet, his eyes wide with vulnerability. As soon as the condemned were securely positioned on the platform, a man with a dignified presence emerged. He commanded attention with his striking figure, exuding an aura of authority and wisdom. Towering above the crowd, he stood tall and possessed a commanding presence. Adorned in elegant robes, his regal attire added to his air of grandeur, demanding the respect and attention of all who beheld him. Ahem. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here today as an emissary of the Empire, entrusted with the solemn duty to execute the will of our revered ruler, he proclaimed, his voice resolute. 
Each of the individuals standing before you has been condemned to death by imperial decree. He continued, his tone measured yet filled with conviction, all three men standing before you has been found guilty of desertion from their military post, a betrayal of their duties, and a breach of the trust bestowed upon them by the empire. The abandonment of their comrades and responsibilities has undermined the integrity of our armed forces. As Ethan observed, he grasped the underlying purpose behind this grim spectacle. It was a display meant to instill fear among the citizens who were compelled to take up arms in the Empire's ongoing battle against monsters and oppositions. The constant struggle against these threats had necessitated the Empire's need to deter deserters and rebels through such fear-inducing measures. The execution served as a stark reminder of the consequences awaiting those who chose to abandon their military duties or rise against the Empire, ultimately aiming to maintain order and discourage willful thinking. A sense of indignation surged through Ethan. Those bastards are taking it too far, he muttered under his breath. The spectacle of the public execution seemed excessive in his eyes. He couldn't help but feel a growing discontent with the Empire's methods, perceiving them as overly harsh and lacking in compassion. The emissary continued his speech, gently shifting his gaze to the young woman. This wench has been found guilty of the grave crimes of blasphemy and heresy. By openly defying the divine order and challenging the beliefs upheld by our empire, she has disrupted the spiritual harmony that is crucial to our society. Blasphemy. Ha! You damn imperial demons are nothing but conniving snakes, using the name of God to push your twisted agendas and manipulate your blind followers like mindless sheep. Don't think you'll get away with your wicked schemes. The day of reckoning will come, and the fires of hell will claim your deceitful souls. You'll get what you deserve, you filthy liars and power-hungry demons, the woman spat out with fierce contempt, her words filled with disdain. The emissary paused, the weight of the woman's defiant words hanging heavily in the air. In that moment, a silent exchange passed between the emissary and the executioner standing beside the condemned woman. No words were needed, as the understanding was conveyed in a single glance. Without hesitation, the executioner's axe swiftly descended, severing the woman's life with a chilling precision. The crowd stood in shocked silence. A sickening display of crimson liquid burst forth from the severed neck, drenching the air in a downpour of otherworldly red liquid. It cascaded through the atmosphere, twisting and contorting in a morbid mid-air dance, evoking an unsettling sensation that permeated the entire execution ground. Splash! Splash! With a nauseating momentum, her head hurtled down the stage, bouncing and rolling with a grotesque sound. Each jarring movement of the tumbling head traced a grotesque path, leaving behind a trail of glistening blood. Despite the horrifying scene that unfolded before them, the onlookers found themselves transfixed, unable to tear their horrified gazes away. Ahem, my apologies for the abrupt interruption. Now, let us proceed, the emissary declared. Finally, his eyes settled upon the young man, the one who seemed barely an adult. The young man had committed no crime himself. However, his father's ill-fated actions had insulted the pride of a nobleman, resulting in a severe punishment that extended to their entire family. As a cruel form of retribution, the Empire's decree mandated that all members of his family, including his son, were to face the punishment of beheading. Ethan's mind was reeling with disbelief and shock as he listened and witnessed the unjust fate befalling the young boy. It was utterly inconceivable that someone so young, appearing no older than twelve or thirteen, could be condemned to such a tragic end for a mistake that was not his own. As the weight of his impending fate settled upon him, the young boy could no longer contain his emotions. Dad. Dad, he sobbed, his voice choked with grief. Please, someone, save me. I didn't do anything wrong. I beg you. His voice echoed through the crowd, a desperate plea for mercy, as he reached out to anyone who would listen. His anguished cries carried the weight of an injustice of a life cut short. The reality of the situation gripped the hearts of onlookers, leaving them in pained silence, unable to provide the solace and salvation that the boy desperately sought. Poor boy. 
Ethan whispered, his voice trembling with emotion. The weight of the situation pressed heavily upon Ethan's soul as he grappled with the injustice of it all. Tears streaming down his face were a testament of his empathy and emotions that surged within him. In that moment, he yearned for a different outcome, one where the young man could be spared from this cruel destiny. As to conclude his presence, the emissary let out a final statement. It is with great regret that the Empire has determined these executions necessary to ensure the safety, order, and integrity of our realm. May their fate serve as a stark reminder of the consequences of actions that threaten our Empire's foundation and the faith that binds us together. In a breathtaking display reminiscent of exploding fireworks, for other lives met their end. A cacophony of color erupted from their severed necks, painting the air with a mesmerizing symphony of vibrant crimson hue. Their heads tumbled down the stage. The relentless dance of their rolling heads mirrored the fading sparks of a grand fireworks show. Life extinguished like fleeting bursts of fireworks in the night sky. Indeed, the world in which Ethan found himself was far from kind. Understanding the Meditation Practice After the scene that had unfolded before the eyes of the entire village, everyone retreated, leaving the soldiers to deal with the aftermath. Ethan's parents, wishing they could shield their child from the gruesome sight, fully aware that he would eventually come to understand the despicable consequences committed by those who dared to oppose the Empire. They hoped that this knowledge would come to him in his later, more mature years, when his mind would be better equipped to process such information. Ethan's mother knelt down, aligning herself with her child's eye level, and spoke with genuine concern, How are you feeling, sweetheart? Would you like to go back home and rest? Her words carried a worried tone, reflecting her sincere desire to ensure Ethan's well-being after the event. Contrary to their expectations, Ethan wore a composed expression that revealed a profound understanding of the world's affairs, a maturity far-fetched from a child his age. He met his mother's gaze and reassured her, It's all right, Mom. I don't feel the need to go back home and rest. The day just started, and I want to make the most of the remaining days of my break. I'll stay outside and enjoy my day. Ethan's responded. Ethan's mother found herself somewhat surprised by his response and demeanor. Surprisingly, a hint of sadness welled up within her as she sensed a subtle detachment, almost as if her role as a nurturing mother was being diminished by his unusual maturity. In this moment, a realization struck her. Her child had always possessed a distinctness that set him apart from other children. He rarely cried or displayed childish behavior, always mindful of not inconveniencing those around him. While she appreciated his behavior, she couldn't help but yearn for the moments of carefree innocence and spontaneous joy that often accompanied a child's nature. However, her longing thoughts were abruptly interrupted when Ethan's father gently placed his hand on her shoulder. You heard him, he said softly. Let's head back to the inn and tend to the guests. Let him go and enjoy his day. Be but, she hesitated, wanting to protest, but relented, realizing it was the best course of action. All right, she whispered, her voice tinged with a hint of sadness. Let's go. Together, they turned away from the scene, carrying with them a mix of concern and hope for their son, as they made their way back to the inn, leaving Ethan to embrace the day on his own terms. Ethan, briefly noticing his mother's sadness, couldn't help but wonder internally, why did she seem so sad? Nevertheless, he quickly dismissed his curiosity, eager to focus on the task at hand. Oh well, he exclaimed cheerfully. Let's head to the spot under the tree and begin practicing the second chapter. As Ethan settled beneath the shade of the familiar tree he had been at yesterday, he embarked on his practice, leaving behind the concerns of the outside world, if only for a while. With a deep breath, Ethan settled into a comfortable position, ready to embark on his first task of meditation. He closed his eyes, allowing the outside world to fade away as he directed his attention inward. The sound of his own breath became the anchor, grounding him in the present moment. However, as Ethan delved deeper into his practice, he soon discovered that quieting his mind was no easy task. Despite his best efforts, distractions seeped into his consciousness, persistent and unrelenting. An errant thought would arise, leading him down a rabbit hole of worries and to-do lists. 
Noises from outside would break his concentration, disrupting the tranquility he sought. Undeterred, Ethan tried various techniques to find stillness within his mind. He experimented with focusing on a single word or mantra, hoping it would act as a mental anchor. Yet, the mantra seemed to not make any difference. Next, he attempted visualization, picturing a serene and tranquil place in his mind. He envisioned a peaceful meadow, with gentle breezes rustling through the tall grass. But even in his imagined sanctuary, the noise of his thoughts persisted. Feeling a tinge of frustration, Ethan shifted his approach once more. He continued to sit in stillness, acknowledging the distractions that arose without judgment. With each session, he learned to gently guide his attention back to the breath, cultivating a sense of presence and acceptance. Ethan realized that meditation was not an instant mastery. It required patience, perseverance, and a willingness to accept the imperfections of the journey. Though he faced challenges in quieting his mind, he understood that these obstacles were part of the process, teaching him valuable lessons about the nature of his own thoughts. Ethan refused to view his attempts as failures. Instead, he embraced the experience as an opportunity for growth. He reminded himself that meditation was not about achieving a perfect state of serenity, but rather a practice of gentle redirection. Undeterred by his initial setbacks, Ethan persevered in his pursuit of meditation. Time seemed to blur as he devoted his break to repeating the practical exercise day after day. He approached each attempt with renewed mindset of continuous improvement. Days turned into nights, and nights into days, as Ethan immersed himself in the practice of meditation. He recognized that progress was not always linear, and that the true measure of success lay in his unwavering commitment to the process. What he had was time, and he would make sure to make use of it. With each repetition, Ethan honed his ability to quiet his mind and let go of distractions. He developed a keen awareness of the flow of his breathing. As the days unfolded, he began to notice subtle shifts in his practice and increased ability to observe his thoughts without getting entangled in them, a growing sense of calm and inner stillness. Then, at the final day of his week's break, as if by a stroke of luck, it happened. Ethan found himself immersed in a state of constant meditation, a state where he could empty his mind in command. The days of dedication and perseverance had borne fruit. It was at this moment Ethan grasped the essence of meditation, recognizing its significance and providing him with a clean canvas of sort. This blank canvas offered him the freedom to sketch his vision without the clutter of unnecessary distractions. With this clarity, Ethan embarked on the next step, infusing his canvas with his envisioned manifestations by vividly visualizing each detail he sought to bring to life. One out of three completed. Time for the visualization practice. Parallel Insight After devoting his entire week off to practice his meditation manifestation, Ethan resumed his usual day-to-day -day routine, assisting his parents with managing affairs at the end. Ethan's responsibilities encompassed a diverse range of tasks. In the mornings, he delighted customers by serving them breakfast that his mother made, while the afternoons he diligently cleaned and prepared empty rooms for incoming guests. As night fell, he served dinner to the very same guests. It was during his bedtime that Ethan carved out precious moments for himself, dedicating around two hours to studying and practicing. While many would perceive it as a mundane and dreary routine, Ethan found immense pleasure in his daily endeavors. Firstly, he enjoyed the opportunity to meet new people and immerse himself in their captivating stories. Through these interactions, he not only acquired a solid grasp of the local language, but also discovered entertainment out of their tales, where elements of fantasy seamlessly intertwined with reality. The presence of these fantastical elements made his interest soar to new heights, knowing they actually happened. Moreover, Ethan's studies were not imposed upon him by his parents or society, rather, they were driven by his own volition. There existed a stark contrast between pursuing a subject of study that resonated deeply with one's own passions and engaging in one that was enforced upon, bearing little relevance to his chosen field. Have you ever experienced the feeling of dedicating yourself wholeheartedly to a particular subject, driven by your own motivation, as opposed to reluctantly delving into a distant and disconnected area of study that fails to fulfill your genuine needs? 
For Ethan, the subject of magic was his field of dedicated study and not a disconnected one. As he was diligently studying and practicing the second manifestation technique, Ethan found his natural ability to vividly visualize his ideas and effortlessly sketch them onto the blank canvas of his meditative state. However, he encountered a stumbling block. He struggled to transform these imaginings into tangible reality. To illustrate the challenge, it was akin to creating a drawing of a flower on a pristine white canvas and then attempting to reach into the canvas, hoping to extract the physical manifestation of the flower. Yet, with each attempt, he unintentionally pierced and ruined the very canvas he sought to bring his creation to life. Ethan reached a juncture where he felt completely stagnant, uncertain of how to proceed. He was genuinely stuck. The task of manifesting his vision into reality seemed insurmountable, leaving him exclaiming in frustration, Seriously, how in the world am I supposed to bring my vision to life? It's like asking someone how they got a fancy house, and they respond with, Oh, it's all thanks to the power of manifestation. Well, that's just as helpful as asking a single person how to get into a relationship. Ethan found himself stuck, yearning for someone knowledgeable to guide him through the subject. Alas, he was left to navigate the intricacies of the book's content on his own, without the luxury of external assistance. This stagnant phase persisted for months, stretching even beyond his seventh birthday, with no concrete results to show for his efforts. His mind became an overcrowded maze of thoughts, brimming with ideas on how to make things work. It became so cluttered that his attempts at meditation often ended in failure. Ethan's determination to find a solution consumed him, rendering it nearly impossible to achieve the serene state necessary for meditation until he found his answer. Fate smiled upon Ethan as he stumbled upon the answer he had been seeking, unexpectedly hearing a guest recount their extraordinary journey. And then, out of nowhere, the guest enthusiastically shared, this man whipped out a simple wooden plank. To my astonishment, the center of the plank began to rise, gradually forming a conical shape. But that wasn't the end of it. The surface of the cone started to morph and transform until it solidified into a beautifully crafted arrow, entirely made of wood. It was a mesmerizing display of the boundless wonders of magic. Till this day, I have yet to use the arrow gifted to me. Ethan's eyes widened with a newfound realization as he listened intently to the man's captivating tale. Suddenly, a light bulb flickered to life in his mind, illuminating the connection between the story and a modern-day process. Printing! Ethan exclaimed, his voice filled with excitement. The process of printing, he thought, was remarkably similar to the three steps of manifestation, meditation, visualization, and realistic imagination. In his analogy, Ethan saw meditation as the electronic canvas within a computer device, providing a blank space for creation. Visualizing one's vision became akin to the act of drawing or sketching on this electronic canvas, carefully adding details and bringing the idea to life. Finally, realistic imagination paralleled the final step, the actual printing of the completed and visualized electronic work, transforming it into a tangible, physical representation. Ethan's understanding of manifestation expanded, and a surge of inspiration coursed through his veins. It was at point where he could also view the concept of manifestation through the eyes of a weatherologist. Ethan envisioned the three manifestations of weather, observation, forecasting, and actualization. Observation represented the initial step, comparable to a weatherologist diligently gathering data from various sources, analyzing current conditions, and monitoring atmospheric patterns. It was akin to observing the elements that make up a desired weather outcome. Forecasting, the second step, paralleled the visualization process. Just as a weatherologist would use their expertise and knowledge to predict future weather patterns based on observed data, Ethan saw visualization as envisioning the desired weather scenario, mentally painting a picture of clear skies or gentle rainfall. Finally, actualization mirrored the manifestation process's culmination, similar to the weatherologist's ultimate goal, seeing their forecast become a reality. Ethan imagined this as the manifestation of the desired weather conditions, where the atmospheric elements align and bring forth the envisioned outcome. Overwhelmed with anticipation, Ethan hurriedly made his way to his room and settled onto his bed. 
he prepared himself for the potential outcome of his newfound insight, hoping it would be the key to unlocking his struggling manifestation. Please work. Magical printing process. Ethan inhaled deeply, entering a meditative state where he cleared his mind of unnecessary imagery, erasing mental sketches until his mental canvas was empty. He then began to visualize his desired manifestation, being mindful not to overexert himself, and chose to envision a cup-sized quantity of water. Due to his affinity for elemental magic, he opted to start with water, as it was the most tangible element he was familiar with. Wind was difficult to visualize since it was essentially invisible, and he didn't want to risk burning himself with fire if he failed to control it. Learning to control water first would provide him with a safeguard in case of accidental burns. Now faced with the choice between earth and water, he ultimately decided on water. Why? Because water formed the foundation of his field of study and was the element he was most acquainted with. He knew the taste, touch, and scent of water intimately, having used it for hydration, cleaning, and as a component in food. Immersed in the process of manifesting his desired reality, Ethan delved into the intricacies of a concept he called the magical printing process. Using the power of his imagination, he envisioned his mind as a blank canvas ready for creation, while his hand became the catalyst for the printing process, comparable to a printer itself. In his mental landscape, he visualized the image he wanted to bring into existence, akin to observing it on a computer screen. The next step was to establish a connection between his mind and the palm of his hand, mimicking the act of pressing the print button on a computer to link it with a printer. In the depths of his contemplation, Ethan sensed a remarkable connection emerging between his consciousness and his physical body. A subtle and newfound energy began to flow through his veins, an enigmatic current that he had never before experienced. With each breath he took, he became more finely attuned to the intricate currents that intertwined within him, resonating with his mental image. As Ethan persisted, the fusion of the printing analogy and the magical essence became palpable. He harnessed the elemental magic coursing through his veins, it was as if his thoughts materialized into ethereal ink flowing through the conduits of his being. With a resolute intention, Ethan initiated the final act. As his hand became the enchanted printer, he willed the manifestation into reality. In a breathtaking moment, the water he envisioned surged forth, emerging as if from the depths of an otherworldly reservoir. It flowed delicately into his palm, a testament to his success. Yes. Finally. Overwhelmed with exhilaration. His voice reverberated with a fervent triumph that echoed through his room. For what felt like an eternity, Ethan had dedicated months, if not nearly a year, to figure out the intricacies of this particular task. There were moments along the way when frustration threatened to consume him, tempting him to surrender. Yet, driven by an unyielding determination, he persevered. In the aftermath of his success, Ethan found himself in a state of amusement. It dawned on him that he had, in fact, dabbled in the mystical arts, a notion he never fathomed would become a reality. On earth, this idea would have been dismissed as pure fiction, the stuff of whimsical tales. Yet, in this realm, he possessed the power to turn his fantasies into tangible existence. Chuckling to himself, Ethan couldn't help but exclaim, Am I an honest-to-goodness magician now? Move over, Harry Potter. It's time for Harry Potter 2.0. With a playful twinkle in his eye, he imagined himself donning a wizard's robe, brandishing a wand, and embarking on whimsical misadventures. The absurdity of the situation brought a gleeful grin to his face as he waved the water around. While basking into the euphoria of his achievement, Ethan abruptly felt his body succumbing to a peculiar weariness and his mind drifting towards a state of unconsciousness. Unbeknownst to him, he surrendered to slumber, awakening the following morning with no recollection of having slept through the night. His entire body throbbed with soreness, reminiscent of the aftermath of an intense workout from the previous day. Ag, why does my body ache so much? Ethan questioned his current state, bewildered by the discomfort. As he pondered the source of his agony, a distinct knocking sound reverberated from outside his room. Knock, knock Ethan, are you still asleep? I'm coming in, Ethan's mother announced, entering his room. Sorry, Mom. I lost track of time. 
Let me get ready, Arg. Perplexed by Ethan's distress, his mother drew closer, placing a gentle hand on his forehead. Huh? You are burning up. Oh, my poor baby, you must have pushed yourself too hard. Take as many days off as you need to recover, dear. Your father and I can handle the inn while you focus on getting better. I'll take care of you and nurse you back to good health. His mother expressed a mixture of concern and a touch of joy, finally embracing the opportunity to nurture her child after an extended period. Really? Thank you, mother, Ethan responded, gratitude in his voice. Now, go and get some rest. I'll return later to bring you a comforting bowl of warm soup, his mother said with a light-hearted giggle as she merrily made her way out of Ethan's room. Once assured that his mother had departed the room, Ethan retrieved his book, his body still protesting with each movement. With a considerable effort, he managed to open the book to the next page, hoping to discover some insight into his current condition. Page 4 2.4 Nexus Points In our exploration of the source of magic, we must not overlook the significance of the Nexus Points. Nexus points are channels of magical energy that crisscross one's mana vein, forming a network of energy pathways. These points act as conduits, facilitating the flow of magical power across one's physical body. They also often exhibit unique characteristics and pathways that can vary in an individual's magical affinity. By understanding the geography and dynamics of their own nexus points, the magician can strategically tap into and amplify the flow of magical energy. Becoming attuned to the subtle currents that weave through their body, enhancing their magical powers. However, it is important to recognize that the act of manifesting magic is not without consequences. The exertion of magical powers consumes a vital essence known as mana. Mana is akin to a wellspring of energy within, a reservoir from which the magician draws to manifest their magical prowess. When one delves too deeply into their well of mana, pushing their limits beyond what they can sustain, there are repercussions. If a magician were to consume all their mana at once, an overwhelming surge of power would course through their being, causing a temporary depletion of energy. As a result, the magician would lose consciousness, only to awaken later with an aching body, drained from the immense strain they had endured. It is imperative for practitioners of magic to understand the delicate balance between utilizing their mana and preserving their well-being. To avoid such physical and mental exhaustion, magicians must learn to pace themselves, replenishing their mana through rest, meditation, and tapping into the natural energy flows of the world around them. By embracing this wisdom and practicing mindful mana management, magicians can ensure a harmonious and sustainable exploration of their magical abilities. So, dear reader, remember to respect the limitations of your own mana and cultivate the balance necessary for the safe and effective manifestation of your magical powers. As you harness mana, you'll observe your reservoir expanding alongside your proficiency. Additionally, the complexity of a spell correlates directly to the amount of mana being used. Remember to comprehend your personal boundaries to avoid irreversible repercussions. Turn the page to being the third chapter, The Elemental Forces. No wonder I feel this way. Ethan exclaimed. I've consumed all my mana pool by maintaining the water in my palm. I guess I know what I should be doing before I proceed into the next chapter. As days turned into weeks, Ethan dedicated himself to mastering the control over water and understanding his current mana limitations. He spent hours practicing intricate movements, manipulating small droplets and guiding them with precision. His efforts gradually paid off as he began to summon water effortlessly, shaping it in graceful arcs. He paid close attention to the sensations within his body, honing his ability to perceive when his mana pool was nearing its limit. With diligence and perseverance, Ethan's control over water improved, and he became attuned to the subtle fluctuations in his mana. He learned to adjust his practices accordingly, ensuring he did not overexert himself or deplete his energy completely. As Ethan continued on his magical journey, a full year had passed. It wasn't until his eighth birthday that he finally felt confident enough to proceed to the next chapter. Unforeseen Confrontation Ethan went about his daily tasks in the early morning. He greeted guests, ensuring their needs were met and that their stay were comfortable. 
while working, his father, called out to him. Ethan, we're running low on bread. Could you do me a favor and go pick up a fresh batch from your uncle? Ethan nodded, acknowledging his father's request. Of course, Dad. I'll head over to Uncle's bakery right away. The man to whom Ethan's father referred was not his true uncle, but rather a trusted business partner. Ethan's father held a prominent position as a well-established businessman in their village. Within the kingdom, the prevailing currency was known as the lyrum, a distinctive monetary unit crafted exclusively from a rare ore and through the intricate practice of alchemy. The scarcity of this currency in the daily lives of ordinary citizens necessitated a reliance on barter and trade. Ethan's father devised a unique method to manage these transactions. He struck a beneficial deal with his business partner, allowing him to reside in one of their in rooms without charge in exchange for regular deliveries of freshly baked bread. This arrangement proved advantageous since the inn often had vacant rooms throughout the year, enabling Ethan's father to turn this exchange into a profitable venture rather than incurring a net loss. Using a portion of the obtained bread, he would barter with the local butcher for meat, ensuring a certain quantity of meat was acquired in exchange. This acquired meat would then serve as a trade asset for a corresponding amount of vegetables and fruits. This systematic approach to conducting trades allowed Ethan's father to sustain the inn without experiencing losses. Through these carefully orchestrated exchanges, Ethan's father navigated the challenging economic landscape, ensuring the inn remained a viable and thriving establishment within the village. Leaving the inn momentarily, Ethan set out on a familiar route toward the bakery owned by his uncle, a jovial and skilled baker renowned for his fresh bread. The scent of freshly baked goods permeated the air as he approached the bakery stand. Ah, Ethan. My boy, what brings you here today? Uncle exclaimed, his flour-dusted hands working deftly with dough. Dad sent me to pick up some bread for the inn. Ethan replied with a warm smile. Chuckling, Uncle placed a selection of aromatic loaves into a woven basket. Tell your father these are my freshest of the day, made with extra care. I hope they satisfy the hungry guests. With gratitude, Ethan accepted the basket, the aroma of freshly baked bread tantalizing his senses. Thank you, Uncle. I'll see you later. As Ethan turned around, preparing to make his way back to the inn, he inadvertently collided with an individual of similar height. The unexpected impact sent both of them tumbling to the ground. Agar! Agar! Startled by the collision, a man dressed in a butler's attire quickly approached the young boy whom Ethan had accidentally bumped into. Young master, he exclaimed, concerned for his well-being. Apologizing for his inadvertent collision, Ethan extended a hand to help the other person up. I'm sorry about that. I didn't see you, he expressed with genuine remorse. To Ethan's astonishment, the young boy responded with a swift slap, rejecting his helping hand. The unexpected act caught Ethan off guard, leaving him momentarily stunned. The boy, assisted by his butler, composed himself and began dusting off his expensive garments with an air of superiority. How dare you? A peasant like yourself dares to display such disrespect, the young boy sneered, his tone dripping with disdain. Taken aback by the boy's hostility, Ethan recoiled, his brows furrowing with a mixture of surprise and confusion. Is this kid serious right now? He thought. The young man pointed towards three burly individuals standing nearby, commanding their attention. You. You and you, he barked, singling them out. Yes, S.I.R., responded the three imposing figures, their loyalty evident. You know what to do. On it, sir. Without warning, the three men forcefully pushed Ethan to the ground, launching a relentless barrage of kicks upon him. Each blow landed with a brutal impact, leaving Ethan defenseless and bewildered. Confusion and pain flooded his senses as he desperately tried to comprehend the reason behind this brutal assault. Agar. In the midst of the chaos, Uncle, the owner of the bakery stand, witnessed the horrifying scene unfolding. He rushed towards the young master, Sven, begging for forgiveness and pleading with him to understand that this was a mere accident. Young Master Sven, I implore you to pardon this clumsy boy. 
It was an unintentional mistake, Uncle pleaded, his voice filled with desperation. You better step aside if you know what's good for you. Otherwise, your shop won't be allowed to operate in this village anymore. Make your choice, right now. Sven retorted with a chilling threat. Uncle looked back at Ethan, torn between the consequences of aiding him or succumbing to Sven's demands. In a moment of anguish, he made his decision, stepping aside and whispering softly, I'm sorry. Ethan's mind swirled with confusion and disbelief, struggling to comprehend what he had done wrong to deserve such cruel treatment. The relentless assault continued, the pain intensifying with each strike. Bystanders observed the violent scene, yet none of them dared to intervene. Why aren't they doing anything? It hurts. Ethan's thoughts echoed in despair. Bam! Bam! The young man who had ordered the beating wore an expression of twisted amusement, finding pleasure in witnessing others reduced to the ground, powerless and humiliated. As an eight-year-old child, Ethan had no means to defend himself against such aggression. With no one willing to step forward and assist him, he felt compelled to adopt a demeaning posture in the hopes of avoiding further harm. Lowering himself even further, he submitted to the young man's superiority as the alternative was being mercilessly beaten to the point of potential fatality. In a desperate bid to create a repulsive image, Ethan channeled his mana, focusing the energy into the palm of his hand. He conjured a cup-sized amount of water, discreetly placing it within the confines of his pants. Huh? What a disgusting insect, the young man sneered, abruptly ceasing the assault. Stop. I don't wish to be near him any longer. This disgusting insect has soiled himself. The ploy had succeeded, granting Ethan a momentary respite from the onslaught. However, the shame and frustration he felt at stooping to such measures gnawed at his spirit. He remained on the floor, his clothing torn and soiled, his body battered and bleeding. The pain overwhelmed him, rendering him incapable of movement in that moment. Ethan's uncle rushed over, his face etched with a deep sense of shame, and extended a helping hand to lift Ethan from the ground. Ag, thank you, uncle, Ethan murmured, acknowledging the support. His uncle hesitated, his voice laced with remorse. Listen, Ethan. I. Cutting him off gently, Ethan reassured him, don't worry about it, uncle. I understand the circumstances you were in. I won't hold today's incident against you. Tears welled up in his uncle's eyes as he mustered the courage to apologize once more. I'm truly sorry. And can you please, you know? Understanding his uncle's unspoken request, Ethan nodded. Don't worry, uncle. I won't tell my father about this. I'll keep it to myself. With great effort, he managed to lift himself off the ground, his body aching and his movements strained. Limping towards the basket of bread that had been knocked to the floor, he resolved to carry on, though the pain and humiliation lingered in his heart. Introduction to Magical Theory I Chapter 3 Upon returning home, bearing the physical and emotional wounds from the unjust assault, Ethan swiftly placed the bread basket on the nearest table by the entrance of the inn. Raising his voice, he called out to his father, informing him of his return and the placement of the basket. Urgency filled his words as he tried to avoid his parents to conceal his current battered state. I'm back. I've put the basket on the table. His father began to respond in a room separate from his own O. Oh. You're back. I'll be right th dash. But Ethan interjected, determined to retreat before his father were to see him. No problem. I'm going to go take a shower. His father replied with a slightly apprehensive tone. A hey, uh, okay. With hurried steps, Ethan quickly navigated through the inn until he reached the bathing chamber. As he entered the room, his eyes fell upon a large, time-worn tub positioned prominently in the center. Its aged exterior bore the marks of countless usage with the passage of time. Below the tub, nestled into the stone floor, a cavity housed a collection of wooden sticks. Ethan started filling the tub with water. Carefully, he ignited the wooden sticks beneath the tub, flames emerging from bellow. Patiently, he tended to the fire, allowing the flames to gradually heat the water within the tub. As the water gradually warmed, Ethan undressed himself, placing his clothes into a hamper alongside other dirty clothes. 
He reached for a few wooden sticks, skillfully adjusting them to moderate the water temperature, ensuring it remained at a soothing level. Stepping into the welcoming embrace of the water, a profound sense of bliss enveloped him completely. Ah, he exhaled, surrendering to the tranquil sanctuary that awaited him. Ethan had cultivated a certain habit of utilizing bath time as a sanctuary for contemplation. The warmth enveloped him, instilling a sense of relaxation that allowed his thoughts to flow freely. He utilized this tranquil environment to delve deeply into any and all concerns that troubled him, relentlessly searching for viable solutions. In this moment, he focused his attention on the ordeal he had endured earlier that day. Gradually, his mind pieced together the puzzle, unraveling the identity of the individual responsible for his suffering. The evidence fell into place effortlessly. He had guards surrounding him, a butler at his beck and call, Ethan pondered, connecting the dots. Uncle referred to him as young Master Sven and none of the villagers tried to stop him. It all adds up. This wretched individual must be the son of the village lord. The realization struck him with a mix of anger and resentment. The power and influence wielded by the village lord's son had granted him the audacity to perpetrate such acts of cruelty without fear of consequence. Ethan couldn't help but feel a surge of anger, but quickly calmed himself. Let's forget it, Ethan whispered to himself, a flicker of resignation in his voice. He recognized the implications of antagonizing the son of a nobleman, understanding the potential consequences that could befall his parents if he were to engage in open conflict. With a heavy heart, he acknowledged the bitter truth. Sinking deeper into the comforting embrace of the warm water, Ethan gradually submerged his head, temporarily blocking out the external world. In this momentary escape from reality, he sought solace, allowing the tranquility to wash over him and momentarily quiet his troubled thoughts. Following his refreshing bath, Ethan approached his parents to express his decision to end his duties for the day. Feeling unwell and in need of rest, he requested a break, a rarity for him. His parents readily agreed and wished him a good rest. As such, Ethan retreated to his room. Now, he whispered with a glimmer of excitement, shall we see what the third chapter holds? Retrieving his cherished book, he eagerly turned to the next page, ready to delve into the contents within its chapters. Chapter 3, The Laws of Magic Page 5 We now delve into the fundamental laws that govern the practice of magic. These laws serve as the guiding principles that ensure balance, harmony, and responsible use of magical powers. Aspiring magicians must familiarize themselves with these laws to navigate the realm of magic with wisdom. 3.1 The Principle of Cause and Effect One of the foremost laws that underpin the practice of magic is the principle of cause and effect. This law states that every action, intention, and manifestation in the magical realm has consequences. Whatever manifestation are set into motion through magical practices will inevitably result in corresponding effects, be it positive or negative. Magicians must be mindful of their intentions and actions, understanding that the choices they make carry weight and repercussion. 3.2 The Power of Intention and Will At the core of magic lies the power of intention and will. The strength of a magician's intent, coupled with unwavering willpower, can transform thoughts into tangible manifestations. The law of intention and will highlights the significance of focusing one's mind, aligning desires with purpose, and directing energy toward the desired outcome. Magicians must cultivate a disciplined mind, honing their ability to concentrate and channel their intention with clarity. It is through the focused projection of their will that they can shape and influence the energies of the world around them. Reading the next page held less significance for Ethan. To summarize, he mused, this page emphasizes the importance of mindfulness in the use of magic. It highlights how every action carries consequences, although it avoids the notion of good or evil. Instead, it focuses on the outcomes of positivity or negativity. It seems that the judgment of an act depends on the situation, with one person deeming it evil while another considers it righteous. Pondering these thoughts, Ethan recognized the subjective nature of morality, realizing that perspectives varied based on individual circumstances. With these reflections in mind, he shifted his focus to the next page. Page 6 
3.4 Manifestation with or without Cataclysts A noteworthy aspect of the laws of magic is the distinction between manifesting powers with or without external assistance, known as cataclysts. A cataclyst is an object, tool, or catalyst that aligns with a specific elemental force and aids in the manifestation of magic. Magicians have the ability to draw upon the energies of their surroundings or tap into their own internal mana to manifest their powers. However, when utilizing external cataclysts relevant to the element they wish to draw upon, the process becomes more stable and efficient. The cataclyst acts as a conduit, facilitating the flow of energy and enhancing the precision of the magician's actions. Manifesting powers without a cataclyst requires a greater expenditure of mana and can result in less stability compared to utilizing a cataclyst relevant to the element being invoked. It is a delicate balancing act for the magician to determine the most effective approach based on their own capabilities and the desired outcome. As one embarks on the journey of magic and advances in proficiency, their ability to manifest magical effects without relying on external catalysts becomes more stable. Turn the page to explore the application of these laws and the art of spellcasting that guides the magician's path. The fourth chapter, The Art of Manifestation, will teach you techniques and practices that allow one to channel and direct magical energy through spellcasting. I see, Ethan mused, connecting the dots between his past experiences and the insights presented on the page. No wonder I lost consciousness when I first succeeded in manifesting water. My mana pool was drained within seconds. If I had instead manipulated an existing pool of water and directed it through my will, I could have sustained the manifestation for a longer duration and with greater stability. Contemplating further, he continued, however, I still believe that in the early stages of learning magic, students should focus on manifesting magic without relying on external catalysts. By doing so, they can develop a better control over magic and learn to manage their mana pool effectively. It's similar to a musician tackling challenging music sheets rather than starting with simple lullabies. Though it may take longer to master, dedicating practice to a difficult task from the very beginning will ultimately result in greater proficiency compared to someone who solely focused on easier compositions. The analogy resonated deeply with Ethan, solidifying his determination to continue pushing his magical abilities and wholeheartedly embrace the challenges that awaited him. Recognizing that the current chapter primarily offered informational insights rather than practical tasks, Ethan eagerly shifted his attention to the next chapter of the book. Introduction to Magical Theory I've Closing Chapter Chapter 4, The Art of Manifestation Page 7 in the expansive realm of magic, the practices of spellcasting and rituals serve as the means to weave intricate incantations, enabling the manifestation of specific rhythms that align with desired outcomes. In this chapter, we will explore the art of harnessing magical energies to create transformative effects and the role of rituals in amplifying the power of intention. Aspiring magicians will uncover the intricacies of spellcasting and gain insight into the transformative potential that lies within these ancient practices. For point one, understanding spellcasting. At the heart of spellcasting lies the wondrous ability to blend different types of magic, merging elemental forces to manifest unique and combined outcomes. This alchemy of magic allows for the creation of powerful and transformative effects that go beyond the limits of individual elements. Let us explore the art of combining elemental energies to illustrate the boundless possibilities within spellcasting. Imagine the fusion of earth and water elements, harmonizing their distinct qualities to manifest a spell known as mud form. By skillfully combining the solidity and stability of earth with the fluidity and malleability of water, a magician can mold and shape mud with their intentions. This merging of elements creates a versatile medium that can be used for a grounding effect, or even as a physical medium used for numerous tasks. In this example, the magician taps into the essence of earth, drawing upon its grounding and nurturing qualities. Simultaneously, they access the fluidity and adaptability of water, infusing the spell with its transformative and purifying nature. Through the focused intent and mastery of elemental energies, the magician transcends the limitations of each element, weaving them together to manifest the desired outcome. 
This illustrates the beauty and power of spellcasting, as it allows the magician to combine and manipulate different elements or types of magic, transcending their individual properties to create something entirely new. By exploring and understanding the qualities and associations of each element, magicians gain the ability to blend them harmoniously, opening up a vast realm of creative possibilities. From my understanding, the art of manifestation can be divided into two categories. The first category, let's call it basic manifestation, where individuals focus on manifesting a single type of element. The second category, let's call it spell casting manifestation, which involves combining two or more types of magic to manifest a single unified entity. Both manifestation, but with different characteristics. Ethan's curiosity was piqued as he contemplated the possibilities of delving deeper into magic combination. His mind buzzed with excitement, envisioning the magnificent spells he could manifest by unraveling the intricacies of this concept. Things are certainly becoming more intriguing, he exclaimed, a sense of anticipation coursing through his veins. 4.4 Personalizing and Crafting Spells Within the vast world of magic, a plethora of spells has been carefully preserved and passed down through generations to select individuals or families. However, the majority of magicians find themselves in the position of crafting and personalizing their own spells, as the secrets of established incantations are closely guarded. As a result, it is not uncommon for aspiring magicians, especially those in their early stages, to encounter challenges in discovering their unique path to spell casting. In fact, it is quite a daunting task that can lead a significant portion, approximately 80%, of fledgling magicians to abandon their pursuit. By infusing your own manifestation, intentions, and knowledge into your spells, you create a stronger resonance and alignment with your own path and desires. Consider the elements, deities, or even knowledge that hold personal significance for you. Incorporate them into your spellcraft, forging a deep connection between your intentions and the magical energies you are invoking. This personalized approach deepens the potency of your magic and allows for a more profound and authentic expression of your magical self. As the culminating assignment in the Introduction to Magical Theory I course, you are tasked with crafting and manifesting your very own spell, merging two of your preferred types of magic. This accomplishment will mark your ascent as a bona fide apprentice of the magical arts. As you reach this juncture, you've arrived at the final chapter encompassing the practical application of magical theory. Take a moment to turn the page and discover the concluding section of this book, which presents a comprehensive guide for you to follow. This chapter delves into the realm of ethical considerations, shedding light on the moral responsibilities inherent in harnessing magical powers and offering invaluable insights on navigating the potential pitfalls that may arise during their utilization. Ethan swiftly skimmed through the final chapter titled Ethical Considerations in the book, but he didn't devote much attention to it since its contents seemed quite similar to the third chapter, which discussed the principle of cause and effect in more detail. Ultimately, the chapter emphasized the importance of directing one's magic towards specific targets and being mindful of the potential consequences it could have on both oneself and others. After an entire day of immersion, Ethan finally closed the book, but this instance felt distinct from all previous occasions. The act of closing it now signified the end of his need to reopen it, unlike before. It had taken him a full two years to painstakingly read and comprehend every detail within its pages. Now, his sole remaining task was to understand the meaning behind combining two elements and craft his own spell. With unwavering determination, he resolved to devote the remaining four years until his coming of age to fully immerse himself into this specific task. I refuse to accept being used as a disposable pawn or mere meat shield against those monsters. I will show my true capabilities to those corrupt and self-centered nobles. Ethan expressed with strong dislike and anger towards those who lived comfortable lives while disregarding the suffering and struggles of the less fortunate, even to the point of forcing them into direct confrontation against death. During the initial time he had left, Ethan devoted himself to familiarizing himself with the remaining three elements he had yet to explore. At this particular juncture, he had only acquired a grasp of manifesting water elements, spending several months practicing its techniques. 
The next three years were dedicated to comprehending and mastering each elemental manifestation individually. The first year focused on the earth element, the second year on fire, and the third year on wind. As his fourth year arrived, every waking moment was consumed by his relentless pursuit of crafting a unique spell by combining the meticulously honed elemental skills he had cultivated. Through unwavering determination and tireless dedication, the long-awaited day of his coming of age approached. Dash four years later. Knock, knock. Creek. Ethan Hartfield, in accordance with the mandate of the Imperial Military Service, which stipulates that all able-bodied men aged 12 must serve in the armed forces of the Imperial Kingdom. Bid your goodbye to your family, as we will be departing this instance. Screw your Imperial Order. It had been a few weeks since Ethan celebrated his twelfth birthday. Despite the festive atmosphere, each passing day brought increasing anxiety and stress to his parents. They were well aware that the arrival of Imperial soldiers was imminent, and their hearts ached at the thought of their beloved son being taken away and exposed to countless dangers. Ethan could hear his mother sobbing in her chamber at night, clearly the most affected by this harsh reality. Surprisingly, Ethan himself was unaffected by this predicament. In fact, he eagerly anticipated the soldier's arrival. For the past six years, he had tirelessly devoted himself to mastering the basic art of magic, and now it was finally time to reveal this secret to his parents. Keeping such crucial information hidden had been eating away at his soul. He had never been one to withhold life-changing news from his loved ones, but he didn't want to boast about his pursuits until he had tangible results. On the seventh day following his birthday, in a relatively calm atmosphere, the long-awaited but unwelcome guests finally arrived. Knock, knock. Creak. The sudden and forceful pounding on the door immediately caught their attention. Upon opening the door, they were confronted by the sight of four robust individuals each dressed in impeccable military attire. With synchronized steps and a rhythmic cadence, they entered the inn, exuding an air of disciplined precision. Their boots struck the floor in perfect unison, creating a resounding echo that filled the room. The men's posture was erect, their shoulders squared, and their movements calculated, showcasing a formidable presence that demanded respect. The four men came to a sudden stop, arranging themselves in a diamond-shaped formation. One man stood at the back, while two occupied each corner on both the right and left sides. A single figure stepped forward, positioned at the front of the formation. This individual retrieved a piece of paper and began to speak out loud. Ethan Hartfield In accordance with the mandate of the Imperial Military Service, which stipulates that all able-bodied men aged 12 must serve in the armed forces of the Imperial Kingdom. Bid your goodbye to your family, as we will be departing this instance. Finally, it took you an eternity. Ethan thought to himself, And no, P please, it's far too soon. My baby just celebrated his twelfth birthday a week ago. Give us more time to cherish our moments with him, Ethan's mother pleaded, her voice trembling. Ethan turned around and found his mother on the ground, her body hunched in despair. She cried and begged the soldiers, desperately hoping they wouldn't take him away. Witnessing his mother's sudden breakdown stirred a painful ache in Ethan's heart. It brought back memories of a haunting scene he had witnessed as an infant, the heartbreaking sight of a grieving mother staring at her son's lifeless body inside a cart from the soldier's expedition. His father stepped forward, approaching the soldier in an attempt to negotiate and find some room for flexibility. He acknowledged the authority of the Imperial Order and knew he couldn't prevent them from taking their son away, but he still made an effort to delay the inevitable. Sir, we humbly request your leniency, he pleaded. Requiring our son to depart immediately is a harsh measure. Please grant us some time to absorb this news and spend a little more time with him before he is taken away. The soldier whom Ethan's father had approached swiftly responded with a tone filled with anger, Are you suggesting that the monsters threatening the kingdom and nearby settlement will patiently wait? Each soldier is crucial for the survival of our entire race. Having four of us dispatched for such a trivial matter could result in the loss of hundreds, if not thousands, of human lives. Step aside. Men's. 
Yes, sir. Escort the child away. Please. Don't take him away from us. Pleaded his mother. At that moment, Ethan had grown weary of the unnecessary display of sorrow and drama. Speaking with a decisive and authoritative tone, he declared, I desire to undertake the Academy's recruitment trial. The three soldiers who were approaching Ethan abruptly stopped in their tracks, their faces reflecting surprise. Ethan's father, positioned beside the fourth soldier, and his mother, still on the floor, gazed at him with confusion, unable to comprehend his request. Damn it! I knew it! Those peasants can't seem to stop causing problems, can they? A voice resounded from outside the inn. Creek. Sir, X4. Rest. A man in his late thirties or early forties strode into the room. Observing the soldier's demeanor upon entering, Ethan deduced that he held a position of authority. The man possessed a formidable presence, adorned with a black eye patch over his right eye and a prominent scarf stretching from his mouth to his neck. His appearance wasn't unattractive, rather, it conveyed the aura of a battle-hardened and trusted soldier who had faced countless conflicts. There's always that one fool who thinks they can escape their duties, always trying to crawl up the noble's coattails, remarked the man with disdain. Ethan couldn't comprehend why the man would utter such words, and a hint of frustration crept onto his face. Listen, kid, I don't know where you got the idea of participating in the Academy's recruitment trial, but it would be wise for you to give up on it. All you'll do is jeopardize your entire family. What's the point? A few days of relief, the man advised. I don't understand. How would my desire to take the trial harm my family? Ethan questioned, perplexed. Huh? Are you serious right now? Ha ha ha. This is getting more amusing by the second, the man chuckled. Silence hung in the air as Ethan mulled over the man's words. Look, kid, only nobles and those from esteemed families are permitted to attend the academy. Yes, there's a rule that allows anyone to take the trial, but it's widely known that peasants have no chance of being accepted due to their lack of knowledge compared to noble children. Do you even know how to manifest magic? Do you even have control over your mana? And more importantly, do you know what happens to a peasant who fails the trial? The man asked, his tone grave. What happens? Ethan replied quietly. Their entire family gets executed, and the peasant child is condemned to a lifetime on the battlefield, fighting against monsters. By requesting the trial, it's as if you're defying the imperial kingdom, saying, to hell with your imperial order, I'll act for my own gain, the man explained. With every word the man spoke, Ethan's anger grew. Each trigger word he used running away, noble's coattail, peasant, executed, defiance, imperial order, my own gain grated on Ethan's nerves. Ethan's gaze dropped to the ground, his previous self-assurance wavering. The man's words planted seeds of doubt in his mind. What if I fail? My parents wouldn't be safe. I'm uncertain if my knowledge of magic is sufficient to pass the trial. Those nobles had mentors guiding them, while I had to navigate my own path. I have no benchmark to measure my abilities against. Would I be considered mediocre, at best, compared to those privileged noble children? Gradually, his confidence began to wane, and he felt himself on the brink of surrender. However, in that moment, a sudden warmth enveloped his head. Looking up, he saw his father smiling at him, his hand gently resting on Ethan's head. We believe in you, son. We may not understand what's going on, but we know there's nothing you can't accomplish, his father reassured him. At that very instant, all worries dissipated, and Ethan's confidence surged to new heights. Father, mother. Thank you, he expressed gratefully. Thoughts raced through his mind, screw you, bastards. Am I not doing the same as those noble hypocrites? Aren't they also shirking their responsibilities? Who gave them the right to be exempt from the imperial orders? Shouldn't those with higher authority and power be the ones to take responsibility, not those who work for them? The ones who toil to fill their bellies with harvested crops, tend to their livestock, build their homes, and pay their taxes? 
Ethan approached the soldier who had berated his decision, meeting his gaze directly, devoid of fear or hesitation. With unwavering determination, he declared, I will take the trial. The soldier gazed at Ethan, fully aware that the child had made up his mind. He turned around and began walking away. Perplexed, Ethan and his parents stood still, unsure of what they should do next. However, their confusion was short-lived as the soldier halted and turned to face them once more. The recruitment trial begins in three days. It takes two nights to reach the academy. We'll be departing in ten minutes, so gather your essentials, he informed them. Why, yes. Ethan responded eagerly. Rushing, Ethan packed his necessary clothing and his cherished book into his backpack. As he approached the door, he glanced back at his parents, their worry evident in their eyes. I can't explain everything right now, but I promise to share all the details with you once I pass the recruitment. Until then, please stay safe. Ethan assured them. Both of his parents exchanged a glance, their smiles conveying their support, and replied in unison, We believe in you. As Ethan stepped out of the inn, a hint of melancholy washed over him. This village had been his home for the entirety of his twelve years. For the first time since arriving in this world, he was leaving behind the familiar and venturing into the realm of the unknown. However, his excitement swiftly replaced any lingering sadness as he embarked on his journey towards uncharted territories. Gideon, one of the soldiers commanded, gesturing towards the chariot. As Ethan climbed into the chariot, he was taken aback by the presence of an unexpected passenger. Huh? Disgusting. Why is a peasant boarding the chariot bound for the academy? The person exclaimed in disgust. Master Sven, this child has requested to participate in the academy's recruitment trial. We are obligated by law to allow him to join, one of the soldiers explained. Preposterous. What can a mere insect accomplish in the lion's den? Peasant, you'd better abandon your foolish aspirations and exit the chariot this instant. Master Sven sneered. Ethan sighed inwardly, realizing that he couldn't catch a break. This was the same person who, unjustly, had ordered his goons to harm him at the bakery stand. And now, to add insult to injury, it doesn't seem like he remembers what he did or who he was. The fact that this person was also participating in the same trial came as no surprise, given his noble lineage. Are you not going to respond to me? The hateful child demanded, growing impatient. Ethan met the gaze of the scornful child, taking a moment to gather his thoughts. With utmost sincerity, he replied, suck my dick. W what? The shock on the hateful child's face was unmistakable, his anger flushing his face red. A are you courting death? Soldier. Execute this insolent pest immediately, he demanded, his voice trembling with rage. I apologize, Master Sven, but I cannot comply with your request. Once both you and the child entered this chariot, all privileges granted by your family status were nullified. In the academy, all participants and students are considered equals, and one's family authority cannot be used to overpower those of lesser stature, the soldier explained calmly but firmly. W. What nonsense is this? the hateful child exclaimed, refusing to accept the reality of the situation. Ethan, determined not to let this newfound privilege affect his resolve, interjected firmly, didn't you just hear him? Are you deaf? Do you need me to summarize what he said? He clearly told you to shut up. Why you, Sven was abruptly cut off by a loud voice from outside. Men, we are departing now. Our destination is the Imperial Academy, LYRIA, the commanding voice echoed through the air. The announcement disrupted any further confrontation, redirecting the attention of both Ethan and Sven towards the imminent departure. They had no choice but to set aside their dispute for the time being and focus on the journey ahead. After a seemingly fleeting two days of travel, Ethan found himself gazing at the awe-inspiring sight before him. Imperial Academy, Lyria First Trial after a journey spanning two days, Ethan reached his destination, the academy. Rising proudly amidst an expansive and picturesque landscape, its magnificence sparked the imagination. 
Situated within vibrant, enchanted green plains, the academy exuded an air of profound wisdom and mystical power. The majestic spires soared towards the clouds, commanding attention and inspiring awe. Its architectural design flawlessly combined timeless grace with enchanting whimsy, featuring intricate archways and sweeping balconies that provided breathtaking view of the surrounding horizon. As Ethan approached the entrance gate of the academy, his eyes widened in awe. The gate stood as a formidable structure, crafted from polished iron and adorned with intricate carvings depicting mythical creatures and symbols of knowledge. Its imposing presence hinted at the prestigious institution that lay beyond. As he drew nearer, Ethan noticed a bustling scene of people, clad in vibrant robes of various hues, gathered near the gate, their anticipation palpable in the air. The murmurs of excitement filled the surroundings, blending with the occasional neighing of horses and the clattering of chariots. Indeed, the academy was abuzz with activity, preparing for the commencement of the recruitment trial. Chariots, adorned with colorful banners and drawn by spirited steeds, were stationed nearby, eagerly awaiting their turn to enter the academy's gate. Ethan exclaimed in awe as he witnessed the astonishing sight before him. Humph! Consider yourself privileged to be in this place. Make the most of your time here because once tomorrow's trial is over, you will return to where you belong, the young master, Sven, stated with a disrespectful tone. Throughout the past two days of traveling together, Ethan chose not to acknowledge or engage with Sven. He soon realized that the young master was constantly seeking attention, incessantly talking and attempting to provoke a reaction from him. Understanding his true nature, Ethan decided to ignore him completely. Soon after, the chariot abruptly stopped and the soldiers who had accompanied them to the academy opened the door. We have reached our destination. You will be staying at this inn until the recruitment trial begins tomorrow morning. Until you are accepted into the academy, you are not allowed to venture outside. We will return here to pick you and take you to the trial site. Am I being understood? stated the soldier sporting the black eye patch. Ethan and Sven nodded in agreement, indicating their understanding. After the soldiers departed, Ethan and Sven silently entered the inn and acquired the keys to their respective rooms, behaving as if they were complete strangers who had never crossed paths. The night swiftly passed, giving way to the morning of the awaited trial. As promised, the soldiers arrived and collected Ethan and Sven, escorting them to the designated trial site. The trial site was a vast arena. It was a picturesque scene, framed by towering seats that provided an overhead view of the arena. The site was bustling with anticipation as numerous children, clad in elaborate and elegant garments, gathered in groups, their voices carrying a mix of excitement and nervousness. Amidst the sea of well-dressed youngsters, one figure stood out conspicuously. Ethan, unlike them, he was not adorned in fancy clothing that reflected his noble lineage. His attire was simple and unassuming, a clear indicator to those around him that he was the sole non-noble child present at the site. The contrast between his modest appearance accentuated his uniqueness within the crowd, drawing curious glances and whispered conversations. Why is a peasant here? One of the noble children sneered, their tone dripping with condescension. How shameful of him! Is he trying to insult us? exclaimed another child, their words laced with disdain. You, his mere presence denigrates this holy place, scoffed a disdainful noblewoman, her judgmental gaze fixed upon Ethan. The whispered remarks and judgmental stares reverberated through the air, casting a shadow over Ethan's presence at the trial site. The weight of their derisive comments bore down upon him, but he remained stoic despite the skepticism that surrounded him. As a few minutes ticked by, the attention of the gathered participants was abruptly drawn to a figure standing atop one of the elevated pillars encircling the arena. All eyes turned towards the mysterious man, whose commanding presence emanated an air of authority and wisdom. His posture was regal, his gaze penetrating, as if he held the key to their destinies in his hands. A hushed silence settled over the crowd, awaiting his words that would set the course of the upcoming trials. Welcome, the man's voice echoed throughout the arena, resounding with an otherworldly quality that caught everyone off guard. Whoa, gasped the surprised onlookers, their eyes widening in amazement at the peculiar phenomenon. 
Ethan observed the man's lips moving, but it became evident that his voice carried with an uncanny clarity despite the considerable distance separating them. It was as if the words whispered by the man reached each and every ear in the vicinity with astonishing precision, causing a ripple of astonishment and disbelief among the gathered children. The extraordinary nature of the man's amplified yet intimate voice left them in a state of bewilderment and captivation, as they eagerly awaited his next words, their curiosity piqued. My name is Roderick Spellman, but you may also address me as the principal of this esteemed academy. The resonant voice of Roderick Spellman filled the air, commanding attention. Today is a momentous occasion as it signifies the commencement of our annual recruitment trial, he continued, his words carrying a weight of significance that hung in the atmosphere. Ethan and the other children listened intently, their eyes fixed on Principal Spellman, aware of the rare opportunity that lay before them. The gravity of the occasion intensified as they realized the stakes and the potential impact it could have on their lives. The first recruitment trial is a straightforward one. Principal Spellman explained, his gaze fixed on the massive dark stone at the center of the arena. This stone has been meticulously crafted to reveal the power level of your spells and showcase the elemental combinations employed within them. Gesturing towards the stone, he continued, your task is a simple yet challenging one. You must generate a crafted spell that inflicts a total of 10,000 numerical damage, utilizing a combination of two or more magical elements. Those who successfully complete the first trial will proceed to wait for the remaining participants to finish their turn, Principal Spellman explained, his voice carrying a tone of impartiality. However, those who fail to meet the requirements of the first trial will be escorted away immediately, he continued, emphasizing the swift consequence for those who did not measure up. Principal Spellman's words resonated with a sense of urgency, underscoring the significance of each trial and the need for participants to perform their best. Now, shall we start with the first participant? Principal Spellman's voice boomed, punctuating the air with anticipation. In response to his command, a series of radiant lights materialized above each participant's head, displaying numerical values. The shimmering lights seemed to indicate the order in which they would take their turn in the trial. The children gazed at the luminous display in awe. As for Ethan, his curiosity filled his mind as he pondered the nature of the lights, contemplating whether it was an intricate manifestation of light magic or an illusionary magic reminiscent of the descriptions he had read in the book. As the first participant nervously stepped forward, Ethan couldn't help but feel a pang of unease. He wondered how far ahead the privileged and noble children were in their magical abilities, given their access to resources and training that he lacked. Observing closely, Ethan noticed the participant brandishing a wand adorned with a red crystal, likely a catalyst for channeling magical energy. Wait! Catalysts are allowed? Isn't that cheating? I don't have one. That's so unfair, Ethan thought with a tinge of frustration, realizing the disadvantage he faced without such a tool. The first participant began conjuring a fireball, its size growing to that of a basketball, poised to be launched. Ethan keenly observed the manifestation, analyzing the elements at play. Hmm, it appears he's utilizing the fire element to generate the fireball. And by incorporating the wind element, he's accelerating its rotating speed and enlarging it by introducing a significant amount of oxygen from the generated air. Ethan deduced, impressed by the participant's technique, but also recognizing its limitations. As the fireball surged through the air and hit the black rock, Ethan watched with a discerning eye the displayed information above it. Damage, 2000. Type, fire slash wind. He failed? Well, that's not really surprising, considering the spell he used. But is it too harsh to consider this attack a mere 2,000 value? Ethan contemplated, his thoughts interrupted by the commanding voice of the principal. Participant number one, failed. Next. The plea of the unsuccessful participant broke the air, desperately begging for another chance, attributing the failure to nerves. However, before any consideration could be given, the principal cast a dismissive gaze upon the pleading figure. With a simple gesture of his hand, the participant vanished from the arena, as if they had never been present at all. 
Next, the principal declared in an authoritative tone, offering no explanation or reassurance to the bewildered onlookers regarding the fate of the failed participant. The swift and uncompromising manner in which the principal operated underscored the seriousness and ruthlessness of the selection process. It left Ethan and the remaining participants the realization that the trials held no room for second chances. Time elapsed, and as the trials progressed, only a few participants managed to succeed while the majority faltered in the face of the first trial's challenges. One by one, hopeful candidates stepped forward, with each passing moment bringing them closer to Ethan's turn. Next, Principal Spellman's voice resonated through the arena, signaling that it was now Ethan's moment to take the stage. Look, it's his turn, a noble child remarked, their voice tinged with amusement. Can't wait to see him barely manage a damage of one, ha ha ha, another chimed in, their laughter filled with mockery. Sven, observing from the sidelines, gazed at Ethan's determined figure, his curiosity piqued. He pondered the source of Ethan's unwavering confidence and the audacity to stand against the nobles. There was a hint of admiration by the boldness he was witnessing. Determined not to falter, Ethan mustered his resolve, fully aware of the weight resting on his shoulders. He contemplated his options, knowing that he needed to choose a spell that showcased his strengths and maximized his chances of success. This spell it is. Dust Devil. As Ethan approached the Black Stone, he could hear disparaging remarks being made about him. However, he remained resolute and undeterred. Ethan exuded a strong sense of confidence, as if he possessed unwavering certainty in his ability to conquer the first trial. Having observed the privileged children's capabilities during their own attempts, he couldn't help but think of their abilities as underwhelming, prompting the thought, how disappointing. Despite their seemingly boundless resources, access to knowledgeable teachers, and extended periods of study, Ethan couldn't help but wonder why their abilities were so mediocre. What troubled him the most was the uniformity of the spells they employed. Without exception, they all relied on a single impact spell. This meant that their spells possessed the characteristic of inflicting substantial damage in a single instance upon hitting the target, but fell short of meeting the passing criteria. The instant the principal explained the rules of the trial, one thought immediately crossed Ethan's mind, damage over time. Damage over time, D.O.T, refers to a specific effect of gradual damage over a period of time, rather than delivering all the damage at once. Dot effects can vary in their nature and mechanics. They can be caused by various sources, such as environmental hazards or status effects. When a dot effect is applied to a target, it typically triggers an ongoing damage effect that persists until its duration expires or until it is cleansed or countered by specific means. Its main purpose is to introduce a strategic element to combat, which, in most cases, provides more total damage than an impact spell if used correctly. Ethan stood confidently. With a deep understanding of the formation of weather, he starts channeling the required elements to create his desired spell. In the wide open arena, Ethan initiated his manifestation by invoking the element of fire. With precise control, Ethan conjures intense heat, trying his best to mimicking the sun's effect focusing the heat on the ground. As the heat warms the surface, it causes the air near the ground to become significantly hotter than the surrounding air. This creates a temperature difference between the ground and the air above it. This thermal gradient became the foundation upon which Ethan built his spectacle. As the heated air near the surface, lighter than the cooler air above, commenced its ascent due to reduced density, a gradual column of air rose with it, an effect known as the thermal effect. Expertly harnessing the wind element, Ethan skillfully guided the currents, employing intricate gestures to induce the rotational motion associated with the Coriolis effect. This atmospheric phenomenon causes moving air masses to deflect to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere, imbuing the rising column with a captivating spin. As the spinning vortex took form, visible to the naked eye, it swept up dust, sand, and other loose particles from the ground, transforming into a mesmerizing display of elemental might, a spectacle akin to a small tornado. Within this magnificent fusion of elemental magic, Ethan's command and mastery were undeniable. 
His creation, a testament to the harmonious blend of fire and wind, emerged as his own rendition of a dust devil, a testament to his skill and creativity. Ethan knew that dust devils were generally harmless and short-lived phenomena, lasting only a few minutes. They were much different from tornadoes, which are much larger and more powerful atmospheric vortexes that form under different weather conditions. But what he had in his possession was magical powers, as such, this limitation were of no importance to him. As to increase the intensity of the dust devil, Ethan added more strength to the rotational speed, which in turn increased its size and power. I'm not done yet. Having not reached the pinnacle of his creation, Ethan embarked on the final stage of his craft. With focused determination, he skillfully reconstructed the small pebbles within the dust devil, molding them into razor-sharp blades with meticulous precision. Each tiny shard transformed into a deadly instrument. As the dust devil obediently followed Ethan's command, it surged towards the formidable black stone, fixating itself upon its target. Stationed in place, the swirling vortex inflicted relentless damage, its destructive force escalating with each passing second, as evidenced by the mounting numerical values. Damage, 123. Damage, 265. Damage, 405. Ethan maintained the presence of the dust devil for a full minute, its relentless assault unabated. Then, with a graceful wave of his hand, he skillfully controlled the wind currents, ensuring their paths were perfectly equal, removing the opposite forces that created the whirling effect. Displaying his mastery, the dust devil vanished as quickly as it had appeared, leaving no trace behind. The storm dissipated, as if it had never occupied that space at all. Simultaneously, the multitude of pebble shards, previously caught in the swirling winds, began their descent with a synchronized grace. Falling from the sky like rainfall. Damage, 10,000. Type, fire slash wind slash earth. Ethan glanced at the information displayed above the black stone and a small smile formed on his lips, confirming his success. However, he noticed that the noble children stood before him in silence, their expressions frozen. Their unexpected reaction left Ethan puzzled, wondering what happened, what's wrong with them. Remarkable, the voice, now in close proximity, startled Ethan. Standing right beside him was Roderick Spellman, the principal of the academy. It was surprising, considering Roderick had been positioned on a distant pillar just moments ago. I've witnessed my fair share of spells that bear resemblance to yours, but there's something intriguingly distinct about yours, Roderick spoke with a sense of curiosity. It appears both simple and complex at the same time. Moreover, considering the size and intensity of this cyclone-like spell, it seems to require surprisingly little mana to maintain and summon. Typically, such spells demand a substantial amount of mana to sustain. What baffles me even more is the absence of any flames erupting from the tornado even though the fire element was used. And to add to the intrigue, you've seamlessly incorporated the earth element into your spell. Truly fascinating. Would you care to explain to me how you've crafted this spell? Ethan gazed at the principal with a mixture of curiosity and surprise. He couldn't help but wonder how someone of such high stature, who was supposed to be at the pinnacle of magical knowledge, failed to comprehend the simplicity of his spell. It led him to question whether the mage's understanding of science was practically non-existent. Roderick gazed at Ethan, waiting for his answer in excitement. Not wanting to make him wait, Ethan replied back, I'm sorry, but I refuse. Roderick stared at Ethan, taken aback by his response. I see, Roderick replied, a tinge of surprise in his voice. But, may I inquire as to why? Ethan paused for a moment, gathering his thoughts before responding. Well, aren't crafted spells typically kept secret from others? Isn't it customary for nobles to guard their spells closely, only sharing them with their direct descendants? While I may not be of noble blood, I'm not inclined to simply give away my creations without receiving something in return. Would you at least share the spell's name? Roderick remarked, a flicker of intrigue in his eyes. Dust Devil. Interesting. Roderick remarked, a flicker of intrigue in his eyes. I shall keep a close eye on you. I eagerly anticipate what you will show us in the second trial. 
In the blink of an eye, the principal vanished from his previous position, only to reappear once again atop the pillar where he had initially stood. Participant number 234, passed, he proclaimed, his voice resonating through the arena. Next. The swift and efficient announcement signaled the commencement of the next participant. Ethan proceeded towards the designated area where the successful participants congregated. Despite the discomforting gazes that seemed to follow his every move, he remained resolute and ignored the judgmental looks directed his way. Taking his seat on the ground, he observed the ongoing trials of the remaining participants. Not far from where he sat, Ethan noticed Sven's gaze fixed upon him, but this time he wasn't looking at him like he usually does with disdain, rather he looked at him with eyes of curiosity and a tinge of admiration. Noticing Ethan look, Sven quickly averted his eyes. Ethan puzzled, quickly disregarded the fleeting moment of connection before returning his attention to the trials unfolding before him. 